Wow, that looks pretty cool. Ooh, that's a good price on that one. Ah, that's what I've been looking for. Hello, everyone. My name's Roger Kugler. This is Working at Woodworking Podcast, Episode 61, Black Friday Specials. I am hoping to help you, the hobbyist woodworker, take your skills to the next level, help your neighbors repair a rocking chair, build a credanza, maybe refinish the kitchen table for someone. You can do this. I'm here to help you turn it into a business full-time or part-time. Kind of recommend part-time whenever you're just starting off and make some money. Today we're going to talk about, well, Black Friday. This is where you start seeing all the deals popping up. Lowe's will have specials. Home Depot will have specials. Menards will have specials. Ace Hardware has specials. Woodcraft has specials. Rockler has specials. Everyone has specials. They want your money. And if you keep your eyes open, you can actually get some pretty good deals. One of the most popular deals is kits. These are packages that come two, three, four tools, all bundled up, usually in a nice little, you know, fabric carrying case with a special price. And these often are just a great way to get started into the woodworking tool buying rabbit hole that you're going to fall down. Now, a couple caveats when you're doing this. Oftentimes, you know, we're looking for Christmas presents here, and doesn't hurt to drop a hint, 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 while you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table trying to digest everything that you've just eaten before the football games come on. Couple caveats. Not all of these package deals are fantastic. One of the things the manufacturers used to do and I think they still are doing this, is they will give you a three-tool package and one battery. Ah, you want to look for a package that gives you at least two batteries and, of course, the charger. The other thing that they will do, and Makita did this, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they would have a special low-powered battery that was red, and they would put it in their packages. It was only like 1 amp, 1.2 amps, something like that. Very low power. Well, if you bought just a regular drill or an impact driver or something like that, it would come with a, a 2 or 3 amp battery. So they would really save money on the battery while still getting you into the tool. So when you're looking at these deals, pay attention to the amperage of the battery that you're looking at. You want something that has some power. Sure, it could be 12 volts, 18 volts, 20 volts, 24 volts, whatever, but it's still that amperage that is going to be doing the work for you. And let's face it, what you're really doing here is you're buying a battery system. So you want these batteries to be the most powerful that you can get and you want them to fit everything, which means if you buy a Makita drill and then a DeWalt impact driver and a Porter cable, I don't know, work light, you now have three battery systems and none of those are interchangeable. Huh, wonder why that is. So I would really recommend basically pick a company and kind of stay with that with your, your portable cordless tools. And really... That's kind of the secret of Festool, isn't it? Everything works together. And ask yourself, do you really need cordless tools? Yeah, I know. They're all the rage. Everybody has them. You know, ha, 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 ha. Look at my cordless tool. Ooh, you are so cool. You have a cordless tool. But do you really need it? Could you actually benefit more from a corded tool? You know, one of those things is you have to plug into, you know, a 120 outlet someplace. Maybe. What's the big advantage of a corded tool? Well, number one, power. You just simply have a lot more power. You know, a standard, you know, household shop circuit, you have 15, maybe 20 amps of power there, where with a battery, you might have eh, three. Ooh, impressive. And the other wonderful thing about corded tools, they never run out of juice. 
You could work those things for eight hours, 10 hours, and they're not going to run out of juice. And did I mention that they deliver more power than cordless tools? Yeah, I think I did. So what's a corded tool not good at? Well, if you've been building that uh, gazebo down by the lake, you're not going to probably run a 600-foot extension cord down there. So that's where power to, uh, cordless tools come in really, really handy. Maybe you don't want to drag a power cable up onto the second-story roof as you're setting trusses. Yeah, that might be a good place for a, an impact driver. Now, here's one that you may not think about if you are into building built-in bookcases, seating systems, kitchens, cabinets, things like that. Doing work in someone's home, cordless tools are really, really handy because you're not walking around with a tool in your left hand and the, the plug in the right hand asking the homeowner, where can I plug this in? Ooh, not terribly professional there. And it's just inconvenient. I really like my cordless tools whenever I'm doing any on-site work. And, of course, just around the house. Yeah, I'm too lazy to grab the corded drill and go and hang a picture or something like that when I have batteries. I can use them. They're quick, they're convenient, they're fun. So don't think that you have to get the cordless the battery operator tools, because there are a lot of advantage of a corded tool. And number one, probably the one of the biggest advantages is just cost. Corded tools are, generally speaking, less expensive than battery operator tools, sometimes by a factor of two or three, because some of these things can get very, very expensive. I remember years ago, when I was starting to get a little older... The legs weren't moving quite as well as they did back in the 20s. And I had to do a, a trim job on, I think it was the third floor of a uh, like an apartment building. And it wasn't going to take very long, but it was one that I didn't want to do by hand because it was a little tricky. And I wanted to use my pneumatic nailer. Well, pneumatic nailer automatically means that you have to bring your own power supply i.e. an air compressor with you. And lugging that thing up three flights of stairs, I vowed that when I had enough money saved up, I was going to buy a battery-operated nailer and not drag this air compressor all over the place. I attached $100 to that value. So if a cordless nailer cost $300, in my mind, I was going to trick myself and said, huh, that's only $200. That's not bad. Just to kick in that extra $100 on, um, I don't know, sore muscles, something like that. So anyway, not being tethered to anything is a huge convenience. And if you need a little refresher on, you know, watts and amps and volts and all that stuff, uh, listen to episode number 41, Electricity in the Workshop. I, I go over all those terms and hopefully help you understand this a little better. Now, something else you might be hearing this time of year is, I don't know what to get you for Christmas. Oh, those are sweet, sweet sounds. That should be an easy question for you to answer. My go-to answer is clamps. Yeah, you know it. You can always use more clamps. Now, you might get fancy and ask for, you know, eh, like a, a trio of 48-inch Bessie bar clamps. Ooh, you have to have been a really good boy this year, you know, to get a set of those because they don't give those things away. But anyway, just clamps. Um, Harbor Freight apparently has some really, really good clamps that have had some very good review. I found some F-style clamps at Menards. Not very expensive. Really, really good. So you can point people in the direction, and you'd be surprised. Just let people go out and kind of explore that on yourself. My my wife, you know, several years ago got me a clamp that ah, I would never have bought that myself. I thought they were kind of silly, and by gosh, those come in really handy. So, yeah, just remember your your spouse may be actually smarter than, than you are. Another wonderful Christmas gift, books. 
anything that you are a little weak in. Maybe it's finishing, maybe it's joinery, anything like this. Put that on the uh, the Christmas uh, wish list. There's some really good books on veneering if you want to get into that. Uh, in fact, I did a, a quick little search and came across uh, Scott Bennett's uh, book list on YouTube as well as uh, Rob Kosman's uh, book list. And of course, Christopher Short's writes really, really good books on woodworking, and his store has a wonderful collection of books if you don't if you don't know exactly what you want. Uh, links to those in the show notes. And of course, you know, my go-to recommendation is uh, uh, Tay Frigg's uh, three-volume collection. Another thing that comes this time of year, right after Black Friday, is Shop Local Saturdays, or sometimes they're called Small Business Saturday where you've gone out to the great big box stores and maybe stood in line at 3 o'clock in the morning to get the best deals, but hopefully that practice is, is, is over. And now they're encouraging you to go to the, the smaller stores, maybe the mom and pop stores, and, and you know patronize them, help them out. Now, if you do any type of retail, maybe online or out of your shop, it might be a little late to to set that up this year, but uh, think about it for next year. Another wonderful thing to do this time of year is craft shows. And again, probably too late for you to set up in any craft shows. But this is a great time to go scouting. Go to some of these craft shows, some that you might be interested in participating in next year. Find somebody who's doing something similar to you. Start picking their brain. Ask them questions. Listen to their to their complaints. <laughs> uh, for more information on how to do these craft shows, uh, listen to episode number 25, Should You Do an Art and Craft Show This Year. But now is a real good time to check out some of these to see which ones you might want to be in for next year. Another suggestion I would have is plan a holiday break. You have been working your butt off all year. You need to take a little time. Now, I'm not talking about booking a trip to Aruba, although you could do that. I just mean close down the shop. Take a week off. I typically take uh, the week between Christmas and New Year's. I don't work on any commissions. I don't work on any furniture repairs or any boats or anything anything like that. I just do me. And I always pick a project, something that I want to build, something I want to tear out and redo, get the materials ahead of time so that you can just tear the shop apart, make a total mess, rebuild it, improve it, and be open for business right after the new year. Maybe there is a project you've been wanting to build for the family or for friends or for yourself. This is a great time to do it, where you're just getting back to woodworking. You remember that hobby that you had at one time that you enjoyed so much that you totally ruined by turning it into a full-time profession? Yeah, that. You, you, You need to do something for yourself every now and then. And of course, it's never too late to start planning for next year. This could be as simple as just sitting down with a favorite beverage and thinking. Turn off the the radio, off the YouTube, off the social media, and just sit there and think, what do I want to do next year? What went well this year? What didn't go well this year? How can I fix it? What direction do I want to take for next year? Just some quiet time. Maybe you want to introduce a new product line. Maybe you want to kill an old product line. Maybe you want to just take your shop in a totally new direction. But just take some time this holiday season and think about these things. If you want to get really ambitious, yeah, you could grab your graph paper that you use in the shop and start jotting down some notes. And, of course, (laughs) don't forget about taxes. Oh, yeah, we never escape taxes. Even when we're dead, we don't escape taxes, although we don't have to worry about them. So maybe you've had a really, really good year and you have made, uh, you've made some money this year and you've been able to keep your expenses down 
and you haven't really made any major purchases. And whoa, I'm going to have a chunk of profit this year. Good for you. Sometimes we can get our mind twisted around to the fact that it's like, oh crap, I made a huge profit this year. I'm going to have to pay taxes on that. Congratulations. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But, you know, kind of psyche, you know, mind tricks is like, oh gosh, I made too much money this year. I don't have to pay taxes on it. You sick puppy. But there are some things you can do this time of year to lessen the tax burden that you, you have. So if you are in a position of turning a profit, congratulations. Consider buying some supplies that you will use next year now. Sandpaper. We all go through sandpaper. This might be a good time to drop two, three hundred dollars on sandpaper that will get you through next year. Maybe there's finishing product that you use. Go ahead and pick up a, you know, a few gallons of that now. These typically have good shelf life. I wouldn't buy more than what I would, would use in six months, maybe a year. But if you are going to buy this in January, well, just move it to December and take that as an expense and reduce the tax you're going to have to pay. Lumber. Go ahead and put your order in now. You know, bring in 100 board feet of maple, 200 board feet of white oak, you know, whatever you typically use, providing you have storage space. Bring that in now, put that on 2022's books and reduce your tax burden. Because remember, we pay taxes on profit. So our gross sales minus our gross expense equals profit. And if we increase our expense, we decrease our profit. Maybe make a large purchase. If you've been really thinking about that uh, saw stop table saw, you know, the the $3,500 saw stop table saw, this might be the time to pull the trigger on that puppy. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take delivery of it right now, but it means that if you pay the bill in 2022, before December 31st, then that is an expense for 2022, even though you may not take delivery, you know, for weeks or possibly even months later. Maybe you've been looking for a CNC machine. This could be the emphasis that you need to go ahead and take that plunge. Yeah, sorry if I'm encouraging anyone. No, I'm not. So if you're planning on doing that in March, See if you can cut a deal, you know, in December. Now, some states, some jurisdictions charge a, an inventory tax. And my state got rid of this decades ago. And our economy has just really boomed. But you might have a manufacturer who's going to have to pay tax on that machine that's just kind of sitting there. And if they can get that off their books, maybe they'll knock a few hundred dollars off of that just to, uh, you know, cut both of you a break. And it's never too late to think about your retirement. I know, you're 28 years old. You should be thinking about your retirement. Because the wonderful thing that you at 28 have that, you know, we old, fat, short, dumpy, gray-haired people don't have is time. You could have 30 or 40 years of accumulated interest that eh, we probably don't. So talk to your financial advisor. Oh, you don't have a financial advisor? Um, You need to get one. You know, that's kind of like having a doctor. Your financial health is just as important as your physical health. And just because you have a financial advisor, that doesn't mean you have to do everything that they, well, advise. There's a real difference between a financial advisor and a salesman. And if you're going to like an insurance agent or something like that to get financial advice, they are going to sell you things that are going to make them the most money. So that's not where you want to go. You need to educate yourself. You need to start reading. You need to start watching some good YouTube videos on finance, personal finance. It's not rocket science, but it's something that you need to study. 
So how could this help you out this year? Well, you know, if you're facing a, a huge profit and you're a sole proprietor, you might want to dump, you know, a couple thousand dollars into a traditional IRA. The money you put into a traditional IRA is deducted from your gross tax that you have to pay this year. You could put it into a Roth IRA. There's no tax advantages this year, but you will never pay taxes on that money again the rest of your life. And I think that passes on to your heirs. I am not a financial advisor, just a guy with a table saw talking about money. So you need to, you know, educate yourself, find somebody who does know what they're talking about and come up with some type of retirement plan for you. Maybe you have a HSA, health savings account. Maybe your spouse has a HSA and you are kind of just, you know, tagging along. If you have some excess money, some excess profit, you might be able to put some into the HSA, build that up, earning money, and deduct that from your taxes. Again, talk to your financial advisor about things like this. There are other things out there, like a, a SEP, a Simplified Employee Pension Plan. This is something that you could set up for yourself with the help of a financial advisor and build a retirement. Now, I want to make a special thank you to Dan, who not only bought me one cup of coffee, but he bought five cups of coffee. Thank you, Dan, so much. Really appreciate that and the the kind comments that you, you left for me. Missed jobs this week. I have a special one. I, I got an email. It starts out, good morning. We are a furniture manufacturer. We have a customer that purchased our something something oak dresser. And there's a link to a web page. He has problems with one of the drawers not closing properly. We have shipped the customer a replacement drawer and drawer glides. We are looking for a repair vendor who could install the drawer and drawer glides for the customer who lives in my hometown. We approve up to $250 in repairs and ask for an estimate prior to repairs if it will be above $250. We pay on invoice net 30 days. Please let us know if if this is a job you would be interested in. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, blah, 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 blah. Occasionally, I will get these. These are online sellers. Now, I, I checked them out pretty thoroughly. Kind of a weird company. There's no prices that are forward-facing, so I don't know exactly the sales funnel that they use for this, but it just kind of screamed, yeah, not good. I noticed on their website a, a picture of a, a bed, and it had a, a wood panel that was about, I don't know, 12 inches wide on three sides, the foot and both sides. The grain pattern was exactly the same on all three sides, which you think, well, that could be veneer, but this was just a little, I think, too perfect. And looking at some of the close-up photos, I think this stuff was plastic. And I passed. I passed very hard. One of the biggest things is that Net30. I have gotten into this with some other companies that, I, geez, one of them was like Net60. Uh, that means that you do the work today and in 60 days they will pay you. I I don't work that way. I, I'm not a bank. I do the work. I expect to get paid. When I sell products online, you pay me and I will build the products because I'm not smart enough to actually have inventory on hand and I'm always running behind. But be careful with these type of offers for, for doing repairs. I'm not saying that there are you know, bad, um, that you're going to get, you know, screwed, but I don't work that way. The, the one that paid in net 60, they asked when I could go and, and look at the, uh, at the job. And I told them in 60 days, I would be happy to go look at it. And they, why are you going to wait 60 days? Because you're going to wait 60 days to pay me. 
and we parted ways. I, I didn't do the job. I'm, I'm just not going to, to do that type of work under those type of terms. So, so be careful. Um, they may come, come your way. Just kind of know what you're, you're getting into. Now, I must say that I did accept a repair job this week. A gentleman called up and said, I was hoping that you would be able to fix my goat. Oh, please tell me more. He had bought this goat in another city that they had just moved from. And it's wood. And it's beautiful. It's made out of wood. I'm thinking maybe south of the border. It's well carved. It's well done, but it was crudely joined. You know, the legs were literally nailed onto the the body. And that's what was broken by the, the movers. But it, it was absolutely gorgeous. And, and I'm sorry, I'm just never going to, to pass up a job to, to fix a goat. Um, I kind of have a thing for, for goats. So recommendations for this week. The uh, book list that I mentioned earlier uh, and uh, the link to uh, Christopher uh, Shore's uh, Lost Art Press uh, is in the show notes. And, of course, do some shopping. See what's out there. You can always use clamps. If you're into needing some tools, this would be a good time to, uh, to, to take a look. And I have a, boy, did I screw up for this week. I was working on this piece that I had to route out the, the ground. Uh, it's a, a carving. And I was using a router to, to take the material down about three-eighths of an inch. And I had an old double flute straight cut carbide bit that's black. That's the first tip. And I knew it was not, it was not the sharpest bit in the, uh, the drawer, shall we, shall we say. And I was using it. It wasn't smoking, but it was cutting, but it started chattering. You know, whenever I was, you would go back on, on one cut, it would, would chatter a little bit. Oh boy, I probably should stop. This is where you should stop. Whenever your brain tells you you should probably stop this, but no, I wanted to get this done, and so I kept pushing it and pushing it, and it's chattering, and yeah, it loosened itself up and plunged. So instead of cutting at three-eighths of an inch depth, it plunged down to about uh, about nine-sixteenths, and now you're faced with how are you going to fix this? I could try to infill that, maybe with Bondo, maybe mix up a wood putty epoxy mixture with the sawdust, because it's it's getting stamped anyway. You're not really going to see it, but yeah, you got color variation, and yeah, I ended up lowering the bit to the 916ths and doing everything all over again. So lesson learned, listen to yourself. Yourself probably knows what you're doing better than you do. Special thanks to listeners in Holden, Massachusetts and Seashelt, British Columbia. Thank you for listening. Check out the affiliate links in the show notes. Buy me a cup of coffee if you are able to support the show. I greatly appreciate it. And until next episode, happy woodworking. <laughs>